interests. Specifically, uh, I am very interested in classical computation, how we can capture it inside machine learning systems. Now, I know that the terms capturing computation, classical computation, uh, capturing them within machine learning systems might not necessarily sound particularly clear right now, but I hope that by the time we uh, go through uh, this talk, it will become more clear and I hope it leads us to some stimulating discussions. Um, okay. I think you need to go into the window again. There we go. So I thought it made sense because uh, I somewhat rarely give talks to uh, mathematically oriented audiences. I felt like it would be good to see the discussion just by giving a bit of an overview about what brings me here and uh, what do I hope to gain out of a session like this. So yeah, maybe just a little bit about myself uh, for those who do not know me. Um, I am primarily interested in machine learning over non-trivially structured data. And by that, I mean graphs. I am very fortunate that basically every other talk before mine has talked about graph machine learning, so I don't really have to introduce it to you all. What I will say is that perhaps my main claim to fame in this area right now is that uh, I was part of a team within DeepMind uh, that has deployed these graph machine learning systems inside the travel time predictor in Google Maps, and it's now deployed worldwide. So wherever you are in the world, London, Cambridge, or otherwise, you can take out your phone, ask Google Maps for how do I get from A to B, and the travel time estimate that the app serves you is served by a graph neural network that we have developed uh, within DeepMind and deployed within the system. And at the time of launch, we have improved Google's previous production baseline by up to 50% in some cities such as Sydney and Taichung. Okay, now besides the machine learning background, I also have a computer science background. I have done my undergraduate degree in theoretical computer science at the University of Cambridge. And I've basically been fascinated by classical computation. This is what brought me into computer science to begin with. And you can actually see me at various stages of my personal development, uh, trying to solve various kinds of computing problems. And uh, this actually towards the end led to me being part of a Cambridge team that won the Northwestern Regional of the ICPC, which took place in Bath. Um, and beyond this, uh, I think I find myself to be a great admirer of mathematical rigor, even though I'm somewhat poor at applying it. So I do hope that uh, the more mathematically minded people in the audience will give me the benefit of the doubt. And if something needs to be made more precise, I'm very happy to work through it together. Uh, one other thing that uh, you might also know me for is I've been quite enthusiastic about the intersection of AI for mathematics, and especially what can AI do for mathematics. And uh, I was one of the senior authors on this uh, paper over here that was on the cover of Nature in December 2021, where we use these graph neural networks to help mathematicians find complicated structure inside mathematical objects, and then use that to uh, settle several open conjectures and pose several interesting new ones. Uh, when the paper was released, it was, uh, I think, quite well released, uh, quite well received by the uh, mathematical community, including the anonymous reviewers that reviewed our work for Nature, that judged that our work uh, uh, marks the beginning of a new phase in the use of computers in math research, and that our separate mathematical contributions were worthy enough of being publishable in the respective top mathematics journals, which we have actually been able to do since then, and specifically. Uh, I was uh, more heavily involved in the part of the project that dealt with analyzing structures in representation theory. And this led to me being one of the co-authors on this paper on combinatorial invariance for cartan lustig polynomials, uh, which uh, was uh, which I worked on together with uh, a bunch of these great people from DeepMind and our mathematical collaborator, Jordi Williams at the University of Sydney. Now, this is the part about using AI to help mathematics, but I actually, and this is going to be the main topic of my talk today, I actually really think there's a lot of potential in going the other way around, so using mathematics for AI. As a result of our successful publication, we were actually all invited to visit the IAS in Princeton. This happened sometime last year. And uh, with a team of uh, our math collaborators and some other deep minders, we've spent a week in Princeton discussing with various mathematicians about various problems that they were facing and how AI could help. But we also had a lot of interesting intercommunications. And specifically, I talked quite a bit with another one of our collaborators, uh, Mark from the University of Oxford. And I shared with Mark one problem that uh, was quite, uh, quite interesting, quite bugging people uh, doing graph machine learning these days. And Michael already presented it really nicely during his talk. That is the over squashing problem. So how do we deal with graph neural networks that are deployed over graphs which have these wacky bottlenecks? 
which block the flow of information such that it's really, really hard to pass information through these kinds of edges in a way that every node in one click can talk to every node in the other click. I showed this uh, problem to Mark. I told him about some existing approaches. He basically just immediately said, why not just use a graph which doesn't have these problems? And he immediately knew to tell us that these graphs are known as expander graphs. And he told us about a method, how to construct them. And they happened to be exactly what we needed to fix the problem. And we just built a method that alternates GNN layers over the input graph and the expander graph. And just by doing that, no hyperparameter tuning necessary, it just worked. It improved a state-of-the-art baseline method by significant amounts on various standard large-scale graph machine learning data sets. And what's also really cool is that uh, it also led to us winning a best paper award at one of the New York's workshops. So what started is basically you know, a serendipitous interaction between a mathematician and a machine learning scientist led to a paper that was, in my opinion, pretty well recognized in the machine learning community. And I think these two directions the, and the illustrations that I'm giving you are just you know, a general claim to the point that, in my opinion, amazing things can happen when AI and math researchers work together in synergy. And that is actually what my goal is for today. Like I'm hoping to stimulate these kinds of discussions, these kinds of directions, and uh, hopefully also inspire you to think about some new problems that you might not have thought about before. OK. That being said, what are we going to talk about today? As the title implies, we're going to talk about classical computation. When I say classical computation, I want you to think about the kinds of things you might typically see in an undergraduate course in a computer science degree on, on uh, algorithms and data structures. So all of these interesting ways to organize information, to transform information, to solve challenging problems specified over abstract structures. So things like sorting, searching, pathfinding, dynamic programming, and all these sorts of things. Now, of course, because this is going to be a deep learning themed talk, we're not just going to talk about classical computation. We're also going to talk about how we can take that computation and capture it using neural networks. Right? I will talk a bit more about what does it mean to capture it, but this is the general theme I want you to keep in your eyes, uh, keep in your minds as we go through this talk. Now, maybe some of you might be wondering, why should we care about this? Like, why should we care about capturing classical computation inside neural networks? Well, here is what I personally like to give as a reason. You think about some of the properties these classical algorithms have, like pathfinding algorithms like Dijkstra, and you think about the properties neural networks have, and you can immediately start to see they're remarkably complementary. Like there are many properties that classical algorithms have, like you can prove that they're correct, they will terminate in a certain amount of time using a certain number of uh, computational resources. They strongly generalize. You can design an algorithm looking at a few small examples on the whiteboard, and that same algorithm will then work the same way even if you increase the input size by a factor of 100. Most neural networks completely collapse when you tell them to do anything like that. And also, they are naturally interpretable and compositional because of the way they're represented. All of these properties would be wonderful for a machine learning system to have, and arguably, they don't really have them right now. And I also argue these properties are very important if you want to make AI useful and instructive to humans. I would not want a machine learning system to teach me about any concept if it doesn't truly understand the concept. If it's just hacking the distribution and the quality of the answer depends on the quality of the question I ask it, that is not something I want teaching me about an area I have no idea about. Like if you need to spoon feed the answer to the system for it to give you the answer, that's not something you can reliably use. And arguably, these are the main properties missing from uh, state-of-the-art machine learning systems today. So if you get this one right, it can be a key step towards building generally intelligent agents. And arguably, our best AI systems are quite poor at this. Right? So let's see if we can try to make some things better. You might also ask, before I dive into how to do it, and this is a question I get often, you know, if uh, we're saying that this algorithm computation is what the neural network is missing, why not just chain the neural network with the algorithm and execute the algorithm like a tool? And this is a very popular approach nowadays, especially with large language models with tool use. Well, you know, arguably this can be a really powerful approach, and I think it's already leading to some fantastic products, but I also think it's admitting defeat before even starting. And why do I say that? Well, let's imagine you have a real-world complicated problem, and you're using your neural network to map it into an input that a tool expects, for example, the shortest pathfinding algorithm, and then you use that tool to solve the problem. This is hopefully an easy uh, pipeline to follow. But if you are committing yourself to just using the tool without really improving your network in any way, you're basically acknowledging your network is incapable of performing tool-like actions. 
And maybe that's okay for the specific product you're building, but that doesn't mean that we as researchers should accept the status quo and not try to make the neural networks a bit better at reasoning. Also, detecting what's the right input to feed into the tool might itself require some reasoning for which you might not have the tool available. So you're continuously going to be chasing your own tail if you just restrict yourself to this kind of approach. So hopefully this gives you a convincing enough argument for why we should be thinking about neural networks that are better at capturing computation. But before I dive into how to do that, we need to cover some preliminaries. Luckily, as I said, so many people before me talked about graph machine learning that this should be a relatively smooth uh, transition. But it's good to go over it again, just because I will probably use slightly different notation than the people who heard before me. So let's assume we have data that lives on a graph, uh, which is a structure that's a tuple of a set of nodes and a set of edges connecting those nodes. And uh, because it's deep learning, we're interested in featureizing those nodes. So let's assume that uh, this capital X is a node feature matrix, which is uh, of shape number of nodes times number of features, such that uh, each row of this matrix gives you the features of a particular node in your graph. Now, we also need a way to specify the graph connectivity. And one standard way to do it, at least in deep learning, we care a lot about linear algebra. So just to keep things more linear algebraic, we're going to use an adjacency matrix representation. This is a node by node matrix, which just its uh, non-zero entries tell you where the edges are. And uh, you can also re-express this in the form of neighborhoods. So you can define for each node u the set of all nodes that are connected to it by an edge. This is your one-hop neighborhood. It might also come quite in handy when we define some of these operations. And uh, as Michael already very nicely pointed out in his talk, when we have data that's specified like this, we are typically interested in learning or designing functions that respect the structure of the graph. And by this, we mean they are permutation equivariant. So I want to find some neural networks, capital F, that operate over the node features and the adjacency matrices, such that uh, if I do some permutation, so I find some isomorphism of the input graph, that's okay. That predictably changes the output of my function such that I just have to permute the output of the function to get the same answer back. And as long as my graph neural network layer satisfies this property, we're good to go. It respects the structure of the graph. Okay. Now, uh, it's always good to visualize what's actually happening here. And the previous equation just tells you a constraint. It doesn't tell you how to satisfy that constraint. So here is one popular way to implement graph neural networks. Uh, the way it works is you have a distributed layer that operates on each node's neighborhood separately. So here you take features of a particular node and the features of all of its immediate neighbors. And there is now this function, which uh, based on all of those features, computes updated representations in this latent space H. Right? So this X and B is just the multi-set of all the neighborhood features of a particular node. And now once you have a local function like that, you can apply it independently on every single node's neighborhood, and that way you get your permutation equivariant function. Well, there's a minor caveat because this neighborhood set uh, is itself you know, something that shouldn't depend on the order of the neighbors. As long as this local function is invariant in the neighborhood, the whole function, stacked function, will be equivariant uh, in the whole graph. Okay, now of course, this still doesn't tell you how to implement this. I've said you can decompose it into a local function, but I haven't told you how to build that local function. So here is a very popular way to build a local function. It's known as the message passing paradigm, and it's a remarkably general equation. So what I've done here is, you know, I've zoomed in on this particular neighborhood here to tell you how the local function works. So here's our central node, here are the immediate neighbors. So what do we do is we first uh, compute a message to be sent across every single edge in this graph by applying our message function psi. So this function takes into account the features of the sender and the receiver node and computes a vector message to be sent across that edge. Okay, now once you gather all these messages, you need some way to invariantly aggregate them. And that's why we need this aggregation function over here. In general, it is any function that maps a multiset or a bag of features into just a single aggregate feature. Uh, for the more mathematically minded people, it's basically amounting to a choice of monoid structure on R to the M. And uh, as long as this thing is permutation invariant, the whole thing will be permutation equivariant. So this O plus, whenever you see it, you can think this can be something like a sum, max, average, anything which doesn't depend on the order of the operands. Yeah. 
And once you've aggregated all these messages, you need to use the aggregate message to update your uh, node features. And that's why we have this update function at the end. So that takes the original features of a node, the aggregate message sent to that node, and updates into a new latent space. Right? And the only parametric parts of a GNN, so the parts that you learn with gradient descent, are the psi function here and the phi function here. Right? That's where all the parameters are. Everything else is just clever data flow. And in reality, these psi and phi's are, you know, just standard, fully connected neural networks that we all know. So, for example, psi might be a single layer neural network where you have a linear transformation applied to the sender and the receiver, and also maybe some learnable bias vector. And you can apply your favorite nonlinearity, like the rectified linear or whatever else you prefer. And the only parameters you have to learn here are the W matrices and the bias vector. And you can optimize these using gradient descent, much like you would in any other architecture. Okay, now maybe this is obvious to some, maybe less obvious to others, but this equation that I just showed you, the message passing GNN, it's a remarkably general model. You can use this equation to express a lot of other things, including transformers as a special case, by the way. Uh, and in fact, I'm even willing to go as far as to say this is one equation that can describe all of discrete deep learning. And let me try to mathematically formalize what I mean by that. So let's imagine I have some generic graph structured input. And by the way, this was already beautifully explained in previous talks. I think we can use graphs as a general representation for any discrete inputs, because once you discretize them, it's basically a collection of nodes, and you may uh, decide or not to add edges between them as well. And now let's say I have this featureized graph, and I have some function that computes some output I care about. I call it GNN here just to say it's a neural network operating over a graph, but not necessarily the one hop message passing rule that I showed you here. However, I claim that I can express any GNN that you give me, no matter how complicated it is, by first appropriately changing the graph structure and then running the one hop MPNN that I showed you before, right? And I've conjectured this in a GTRL paper last year so that you can represent every GNN over a graph and some features as an MPNN, so a one hop message passing network over a rewired graph. Now note this rewiring operation could be quite complicated. It might add extra nodes, it might remove some edges, it might change some of the features in predictable ways, but I claim that this is always possible to do. And what's nice is that we're already seeing some pretty cool evidence that this might be the case, specifically in a recently accepted Europe's paper, a group from the University of Waterloo was able to prove that MPNNs are actually the optimal Bayesian optimal architecture for classification problems over sparse graphs. So that's already a long way covered by this one paper. Okay, now, you know, I love GNNs. I've worked on them for so many years by now, and I really enjoy teaching about them. So I would love to, you know, just dedicate the rest of this talk to GNNs, but unfortunately, I would like to focus on computation as well. So that's really as far as I can tell you about GNNs here. Uh, good news is, if you are interested in GNNs and you want to learn more about them, uh, I've shared my enthusiasm in several uh, lectures that have been recorded and that they are on my YouTube channel. Especially, I would recommend this one, which has about 70,000 views, so I would argue that it's been battle tested by the community. And even though it's from 2021, it still holds up reasonably well today. So yeah, all my prior talks are publicly available if you'd like to learn more. But now let's try to focus on the big picture. So let's try to make neural networks better at capturing computation. Now, uh, we're going to start analyzing this question from a question that, you know, at least to me, it's very interesting, but maybe to you, it might seem a bit inconsequential at first. And that is, can we take these graph neural networks and can they then learn to execute some classical algorithm? Now, what do I mean by learn to execute? Let's try to make that a bit more precise. Let's say, for example, I want to teach a GNN to execute a shortest path algorithm in an unweighted graph. So what I will do is I will prepare this graph input, which will denote my uh, adjacency structure. We have a source node we're starting from, and we have some placeholder like infinity and all the other nodes. I then encode these into a latent space, and then I have a GNN that I just run in the usual way over the one hop neighborhood for a certain number of steps. And I want to check, can I, from the resulting latent embeddings, decode the shortest path tree of this graph, right? So these grayed out edges are the shortest paths starting from node zero to all the other nodes. And the numbers in the nodes are the shortest path lengths to that particular node. So can a GNN learn to do something like this? This is the question. And from, from gradient descent over sampled examples. Now, the reason why I think this question is quite interesting is because in some sense, if your neural network 
if your weights are programmed in such a way that your neural network can produce outputs of a computation for any arbitrary input, you know, arguably the network has captured the computation, right? And also for those of you who are interested in neural network benchmarking or probing the skills of neural networks, these kinds of tasks can be also a super nice way to benchmark how powerful neural networks are and in a very unique setting to deep learning. Like it's a nice constellation of circumstances which we usually don't have in deep learning altogether. The data is infinite, right? For a target computation procedure, I can choose any input distribution, generate data at that size and use it as either training or test data. I cannot do this very easily for image classification, for example. Also, even though I can generate infinite data, the algorithms themselves are fairly complex. They require you to manipulate data with very interesting chains of if-else statements, loops, and all these kinds of things. And there's a very clearly specified generating function. So if you want to do something like explainability methods or credit assignment, you might actually have a greater chance of telling whether the explanation is correct here because you understand the ground truth procedure. So all things that make it a very interesting task to study, even if you don't agree with my interpretation of the question. So, but maybe let's just think, rather than thinking about a graph neural network executing computation, let's think about a more deep question, which is at the basis of it. What makes a neural network better or worse at fitting certain kinds of algorithmic tasks? Like, can we somehow mathematically say this architecture is better than this other architecture at learning to execute a particular <laughs> task? The answer is yes, by the way, and I will show you. Uh, I will show you exactly how to do it. The key concept, and it's in the title of the lecture. I'm going to be repeating it so many times, but it's one that you know I will go through some of the mathematical foundations of it. But I would really like to sh start by showing you a picture of it because it's much easier to visualize than to actually you know handle all the math symbols in your head. So algorithmic alignment basically amounts to I have my algorithm that I want to learn here on the left hand side. You might recognize this. This is Bellman Ford, a very classic algorithm for pathfinding in a graph. The idea is simple. I maintain a distance to every single node and I iteratively update it as the minimal distance of getting to a neighbor plus taking the edge from that neighbor, right? So the fastest way to reach me is the same as the fastest way to first reach a neighbor and then traverse from that neighbor to myself. A very intuitive dynamic programming rule. And on the right hand side, you have the message passing neural network, like I told you about before, just visualized in a slightly different way. And algorithmic alignment is basically saying this GNN is in a really good position to simulate this algorithm because I can break down the different parts of the GNN into pieces, and those pieces line up very nicely with parts of the equation. So the distance variables line up really nicely with my node features. The act of adding the edge weight is like computing a message function. And the act of minimizing overall the neighbors is the aggregation function that aggregates all the messages together, right? So there's kind of a structural correspondence between the equation of the algorithm I'm trying to fit and the equation of the GNN that's trying to simulate it. This is what we mean by algorithmic alignment intuitively. And using this framework, we can actually mathematically formalize why an architecture might be better for a task. And I should also clarify what I mean by the word better. I mean better sample complexity. So you need fewer training examples to learn it to a particular degree of error epsilon or something like this, right? And this, uh, this whole theoretical analysis was exposed by this paper from MIT, What Can Neural Networks Reason About? And in this paper, they prove a theorem which says that better algorithmic alignment to the target task means better generalization, i.e. smaller sample complexity. And they also have this nice follow-up claim that graph neural networks tend to algorithmically align to dynamic programming algorithms as you can see by this one example here, which is pretty good news for us because dynamic programming is a very generic uh, framework for expressing classical computation. Now, I will, because this is a more mathematics-oriented crowd, I will sketch out the argument of their proof just so that you understand on a high level how they're able to derive this. So preliminaries, we assume that we have some function that we want to learn to approximate our target, G, and we assume our data comes from some distribution, D, and our neural network architecture used to learn F is A. So we say that our target function is M epsilon delta learnable, if, if we take a data set of size m, so that the m is the number of samples we have in our training data, and we draw it iid from the distribution uh, that we have in d, 
we can indeed then learn such an F with our architecture such that uh, uh, it is uh, the probability of having an error smaller than epsilon is greater than one minus delta. For those of you who do pack-based style uh, theory, this is a very pack-like argument, probably approximately correct. And you can denote the smallest M for which you'll get M epsilon delta learnability, so the smallest data set that will lead to a particular level of error as the sample complexity of that particular uh, error rate, right? So this is this really, the sample complexity is just telling you what is the smallest data set size that will guarantee in this pack sense that I have an error up to epsilon with probability one minus delta or higher. Okay, now here's how the alignment part factors in. Let's assume I can take my neural network architecture A and break it down into modules A1 to AN. And let's assume that if I were to replace those modules with uh, specific functions G1 to GN, I would exactly recover G, my target function. So that's, that's the assumption. Like I'm breaking my network into pieces and those pieces line up to parts of my target, right? That's exactly what we did with breaking down the DP rule as well previously. And now I can say that my architecture algorithmically aligns to the target if I need to take the max sample complexity of learning each one of my components to align with the GI, uh, if uh, the maximum number of uh, maximum size of the data set times the number of modules is no bigger than n. Okay. And now comes the theorem that they were able to prove in this paper. If you have m epsilon delta algorithmic alignment of a to g, they prove that you can learn G with this architecture in big O of epsilon and big O of delta for the same number of examples. So you're guaranteed to have equal or better uh, error for the same number of training examples if you align your architecture properly. That's the general idea. There's obviously a few assumptions around this uh, proof. Specifically, you're assuming that your learned function is stable in terms of which data set you sample with this uh, sampling operator. And you're also assuming that your uh, modules that you learn are, are, are legit uh, continuous. Now, what's very nice about this is that it's uh, also something that's reasonably easy to empirically validate. So what they did in this paper is they had a progressive set of uh, more and more challenging algorithmic problems, and they asked various types of neural networks to try to fit them to see what accuracy they will get. So, and the types of models we have here are DNNs ran for K layers, deep sets, which is a GNN where the adjacency is just the identity. So there you're not using the graph structure, you're just processing every node separately. And MLPs, the classic baseline where you concatenate all the nodes together and you're not mindful of the node boundaries at all. So first task, you have a set of points on the real line. What's the maximal distance between any two? This is actually a problem you can solve as a set statistic problem. You take the maximum coordinate, the minimum coordinate, and you sum them, or sorry, you, you subtract them, right? So deep sets can learn this quite well. GNNs can learn this quite well. MLPs struggle because they have no idea of object boundaries, and they need a much bigger sample complexity to resolve this. Now let's make it a bit more challenging. I'm not asking you for the maximal distance. I'm asking you for which two points have the maximal distance. Now suddenly deep sets are going to struggle because this is no longer a set summary problem. Now I need to reason about the relation between the objects in my set. And GNNs, which are primed to reason about edges, they do still really well. Deep sets collapse to about 20% accuracy. And lastly, you can ask them a traditional dynamic programming problem. What's the shortest path length in a, in a weighted graph? And you can see, once again, MLPs and deep sets struggle. And GNNs, as you increase the number of layers towards the theoretical expected number of layers, your accuracy increases. So this is empirical validation for the sample complexity argument that you solved for. Now, this I think this work was quite influential in how I shaped my opinions about the area of algorithmic reasoning, but I also felt like some aspects of the theory were missing at the time, which led to us publishing a follow-up paper, which then convinced the authors of the original paper to, to publish another follow-up, which is linear algorithmic alignment. And it's a very nice uh, kind of addition to the theory, which explicitly takes into account extrapolation. Let's talk about extrapolation. Why do, what do we really care about when we teach a model to imitate an algorithm? Now, algorithmic alignment is a powerful tool, but it doesn't mean you can be reckless. It doesn't mean I can take a GNN and throw it at any algorithmic problem and expect great performance no matter what I do with the GNN. Of course, it doesn't work that way. There's no free lunch. 
And arguably, what we really care about when we teach a model to reason like an algorithm is out of distribution generalization. Like if you've truly learned the circuitry of the algorithm, you should gracefully perform even if I give you some input that is nowhere near your training data distribution, which is so-called out of distribution generalization. And most neural networks tend to collapse in this regime. So it's really, really hard. And you know, even though GNNs are the right class of model for algorithmic tasks, it doesn't mean you can just take any GNN and expect great results out of distribution. In reality, you can very easily overfit to some aspects of the input distribution for a particular training size, and that you know hacks the distribution and sidesteps the actual circuitry you're trying to learn, right? So the original algorithmic alignment paper was had a shortcoming in that they assumed that the distribution D was the same one for training and for test data, right? They were measuring error on D rather than on some other D which is outside of the distribution. And that's what made them have this blind spot towards extrapolation, which is arguably quite important for learning uh, reasoning capabilities. Now, based on some follow-up papers, including our own, the authors from MIT have updated their paper with a follow-up, uh, how neural networks extrapolate. And let's talk a little bit about how they approach this analysis of extrapolation. They first don't focus on GNNs, they focus on one of the key components of GNNs, which is the message function, right? We mentioned before, the message function is arguably one of the central parametric parts of the GNN. And we typically implement them using something like a ReLU MLP, right? So some uh, learned affine transformation of the sender and the receiver with some nonlinearity, maybe stacked multiple layers and so on. And uh, one thing that's uh, quite important, and I think uh, Gita already observed it in her talk, is that once you stack a bunch of ReLU MLPs on top of each other, you basically end up with a piecewise linear function, right? And this actually means that uh, once your data moves sufficiently far away from the training set, your MLP enters a pure linear regime, like it latches onto that pure linear part of the piecewise linear. And this leads us to, in my opinion, a truly beautiful geometric argument that the authors have done in their work. Specifically, what they first did is they proved how quickly will a ReLU MLP approach the purely linear part of the piecewise linear once you escape the training set. And they actually found that the convergence rate is one over T for any direction TV from the origin. Okay, and uh, once again, there are some assumptions. They have derived these results in the neural tangent kernel regime, which means we assume that a neural network is infinitely wide, that it's randomly initialized, and it's trained by gradient descent with infinite decimal steps. Not very, not always very realistic assumptions, but they've been proven to be quite useful for analyzing properties of neural networks. And in this case, I think they're quite telling for what we observe empirically as well. These uh, models very quickly converge to linear once you escape the training data. And this, I think, has a pretty obvious implication if you want to learn out of distribution. If your targets are not linear, you have nothing to look for, right? And this is much better illustrated visually than by looking at theorems. Here's a few visualizations. So here in blue, training set, uh, gray target function, and black where the ReLU MLP learns. And I mean, I don't think I need to explain these pictures particularly. The moment you veer even slightly outside of the range of the training set, this thing becomes linear. So a very simple corollary is unless your thing is linear, there's no way it's going to extrapolate. Unless the target function is linear, there's no way this thing is going to extrapolate. And actually, it's not just sufficient that the, that, the, uh, that the target is linear. You also need the sufficient training set support in all directions. So if you only support one quadrant of the directions, then it will learn kind of a wonky linear function. If it has only one quadrant, it will look like this. And if it has a line, then it will completely miss the hyperplane. But if it has sufficient support, they actually have a fairly stable result, positive result, saying that you can actually learn it over a wide range of hyperparameters. OK. So now that we understand how MLPs extrapolate when they have values, let's slot that back into GNNs, right? We can define this notion of linear algorithmic alignment as a slight modification of previous arguments. So let's assume our neural network A can be broken down into modules as before. And let's assume if we replace those modules with functions, we recover the target function. And now we say that we have a linear algorithmic alignment if all of these GI modules are linear. Right? So if all parts of your model have to learn a linear function, then you have linear algorithmic alignment. Yeah? 
And as we've just shown with, uh, with this theory and the geometric examples, if your architecture uses just ReLU activations, this is the only case in which it's capable of extrapolating. Well, uh, the authors of this paper haven't actually proved this statement. They only hypothesize it. But they have proved it for a specific task, which is a max degree computation task. And you can then use this insight to derive a whole load of algorithmically aligned GNNs just by trying to match your targets to be as linear as possible. And we'll cover a few examples of this shortly. But what I want to tell you before diving into those examples is that the story doesn't really end there. So linear algorithmic alignment uh, only applies when you have a piecewise linear MLP. And nowadays, people are using more uh, new activation functions like gel use and things like that, which have a nonlinearity inside them. And uh, which are not piecewise linear, sorry. And uh, this then led to some follow-up theory that took linear algorithmic alignment and made it even more generic. So one such uh, direction is causal algorithmic alignment from the folks at Purdue, which actually said, if you want to out of distribution generalize, in general, you need to carry a causal model that tells you what your data looks like at test time. And you'll end up recovering linear algorithmic alignment by assuming your hypothesis class uses rel MLPs and your test set is just uniform everywhere, right? But in general, you need to carry a very elaborate causal model of what your test graphs are going to look like if you want to have any hope of generalization. And we also had our own shot at uh, trying to elaborate on the out, out of distribution generalization issue uh, beyond ReLU activations in our work, which uses category theory, which was published at NERVS 2022, and tries to kind of understand both graph neural networks and dynamic programming as categorical constructs. And specifically, we show that you can interpret both of them as a case of a construct known as a polynomial functor. And then once you have a polynomial functor for both your GNN and your algorithm, you can do algorithmic alignment by just aligning the specific morphisms to their targets. Now, I want to show you some cool examples of how we can use linear algorithmic alignment to just very quickly get more potent generalizable architectures. Playing the alignment game. The first one, which I always find this example quite uh, close to my heart to give, because I actually had to fight a bit of an uphill battle to get the community to recognize this. So you're fitting you know, a function which has a min aggregator like this. Naturally, I hope it makes sense to you that we should maybe try to use an aggregator like Max here because they are aligned to each other. I need to stress to you, this was actually quite controversial at the time because there were well-known results in GNN expressivity that Max aggregations were weaker than some aggregations and you should generally never use them. But the reality is I don't care about the weaker expressive power if it means I will generalize better and collapse the things which should be collapsed, which have the same shortest paths, right? So now with linear algorithmic alignment, this is actually trivial to justify because if you take a max aggregation, your message function is linear. If you take a sum aggregation, your message function is highly nonlinear, right? The one that you actually have to learn such that when you pipe it into sum, you get the same output, right? So this is one very simple thing you can do. Just modify the architecture such that your target uh, functions are linear. Another thing you can do, and we actually did this uh, same idea in our AI for maths paper, uh, where we actually got the best results in our representation theory investigation by carefully aligning our GNNs to uh, known algorithms that computed representation theoretic constructs that we cared about. And this was derived through direct communication with uh, Jordi, who was our math collaborator in this effort. He told us what these algorithms looked like, and then we took the effort to take the structure of these equations and bake them into how the GNN operates. And this is what allowed us to see the hidden structure inside these objects, which then led to significant progress and open conjectures in representation theory. Another thing you can do, which feels quite simple, but now with linear algorithmic alignment, we can justify it, is to modify the features. So input features, that is. So imagine one very common problem, which is not strictly an algorithmic problem, but it's closely related, is physics simulations. So imagine you have to do like n-body physics simulations of how, say, the, here you have n bodies orbiting over a sun and you have gravitational forces acting on them. You have to simulate that to predict how the different points move. Well, as you probably know, forces which govern how these bodies move around follow an inverse square law. So if you decide to featureize your graph by just putting distance into the edges, now you have to learn a complicated inverse square function to be able to simulate this. But if you preempt the whole thing and you just put an inverse square function of your uh, distances as your edge features, now suddenly your forces are a linear function of those features and you get much better extrapolation performance on those physics tasks. So it's a very simple thing, but linear algorithmic alignment gives us a concrete algorithmic reason 
why it's a good idea to pack your features in a way that promotes better generalization. And arguably, for physics simulations, you care about extrapolating because you want to be able to simulate the physics in environments you haven't seen in your simulator. The third thing you can do is you can also mathematically constrain the architecture. So you find some constraint that your target algorithm has, which uh, is a property it must respect, and you try to find a cool way to make your neural network to follow the same constraint. And one very popular paper, which does a really simple change towards this, is the iter GNN paper that was published at NeurIPS 2020. And there they looked at, OK, fitting pathfinding algorithms. Pathfinding algorithms and many other algorithms have this nice homogeneity property, which means if I multiply all of my edge weight by lambda, the shortest paths are the same. They're just the length is multiplied by lambda, right? And this multiplicative property is actually something that's quite easy to enforce in a neural network. If you remember, we previously had the affine layer with a ReLU on top. If you just remove the bias vector, so you remove the affine component, you just leave the linear component, now suddenly this equation satisfies this constraint. So all they did as part of this paper is they took out all the bias vectors from their MLPs, and they immediately observed an improvement in, uh, in accuracy of fitting shortest paths. So that's the third thing that you can do that's really simple. OK, now uh, I'm slowly reaching kind of the final parts of the talk. I've hopefully given you a flavor of how it feels to capture computation inside neural networks and to constrain them towards certain kinds of computations. But now I want to go into something that's very new. Uh, papers are only coming out in the last couple of weeks or months around this topic. And I think it's quite important. Reconciling graph neural networks or neural networks generally with asynchrony. What do I mean by this? So we discussed at the beginning of this talk that GNNs and transformers and all of these popular models tend to really struggle when you ask them to reason about very long range stuff, especially out of distribution. Now, I claim that performing any kind of reasoning on a high level amounts to executing some internal algorithm to approximately solve a problem. And I hope at least if you subscribe to the Curry-Howard isomorphism, you at least in principle agree with me, okay? Now, uh, here we actually hit a fundamental roadblock to the way things are done with GNNs and transformers. Because most problem solving techniques are actually asynchronous. You don't update all of your variables at once. You update a few of them, then use the results to update some other ones, and so on and so forth. And this is a topological constraint of the task you're solving. It's nothing to do with the algorithm. Like, for example, if you're doing a pathfinding exercise in a graph, you must wait for the signal to reach a node before you can meaningfully reason about it. There's nothing you can do about it beforehand. Topologically, it's not possible, right? And uh, therefore, if you actually try to update a node when topologically you shouldn't be updating a node, this is opportunistic and prone to failures. It will give you great performance in distribution, but out of distribution, you're learning something that has nothing to do with the topology of your problem. And yet, all of our top models are synchronous. They update all the nodes or tokens everywhere all the time. And think about what does a message function of a fully synchronous model have to look like so it can imitate something like this. It basically, you have to learn a ton of identity functions for most nodes that are untouched. And then you have to learn something highly complex in others. And this very bimodal uh, way of building the function is something that you might be able to learn in distribution, in context, but then try it on something that's outside of that context, especially when it's trained with gradient descent, you're gonna have a bad time, okay? So how can we then reconcile graph neural networks with these various forms of asynchrony? There are three general directions I'd like to mention to you, and we will dive deeply into one of them. The first one, which uh, was uh, proposed by parallel algorithmic alignment paper that was published together with uh, uh, Valerie Engelmeyer, Dobre Georgiev, and myself at an ICML workshop earlier this year, is just to say, OK, so if uh, executing asynchronous algorithms is a bad idea, try to execute parallel algorithms whenever possible. OK, I mean, this is elegant, scalable, and sound, but you cannot always make a parallel version of an algorithm. Sometimes the task topology just doesn't let you do that. Another option you have is to literally build a GNN that is asynchronous or a transformer that is asynchronous. So a model that doesn't update all the states everywhere all the time. There have been two attempts in relatively recent time. One of them, I think, came out just last week on the archive. Uh, asynchronous GNNs from uh, ETH, Lucas Faber and Roger Wattenhofer, and cooperative GNNs uh, from Oxford. Michael is also one of the co-authors on this one, where basically nodes can, in one way or another, selectively decide when to send, when to receive, 
and when to reject the message, okay? Now, this obviously will directly solve the problem, like you can express all of the behaviors you would in principle want, but how do you scale this on modern hardware? Like, how do you make this parallelizable? How do you handle the discrete decisions? You might need to introduce something like a Gumball softmax estimator or something like reinforcement learning, which is like a double stacked optimization problem. It's not easy. I really love these developments. I think we need to be doing more of this. I just find that it's going to be tricky, like until we build better hardware, it's going to be tricky to truly find the production use for something like this. So we have discovered a third way, which uh, we published uh, in uh, an ICML workshop a few months ago, asynchronous algorithmic alignment, which actually says, okay, you know what? Synchronous GNNs work the best on the current hardware. Let's just say I'm gonna use synchronous GNNs, but I'm gonna use maths to tell me how do I constrain my synchronous GNN so that it invariantly behaves even if I choose to randomize the messages, right? So now I can uh, relish in all the benefits of my GPU or TPU acceleration while at the same time being comfortable that idempotent things are processed idempotently, yeah? And in my opinion, at least, this hits a sweet spot between soundness, scalability, and feasibility and opens the door to a lot of really interesting math. So let me tell you a little bit about asynchronous algorithmic alignment. So general strategy is we assume that our target algorithm has some kind of asynchrony, which means some variable updates can be processed arbitrarily without affecting the result. And our strategy is we describe several levels of asynchronous alignment where we gradually relax the synchronicity of GNNs. And we try to make sure that that relaxation doesn't change the results of running the layer. Right? And satisfying these constraints will then induce an asynchronous algorithmic alignment to any algorithm that supports the same level of asynchrony. So let's analyze again our GNN equation. So if you remember the picture from before, this is how a GNN typically operates. And this is a diagrammatic way of representing it. So specifically, a GNN synchronizes on two specific things. You have a synchronization on waiting for all your messages to arrive before you can process them further. And you have a synchronization on waiting on your uh, update function to finish before you can send a new message, right? Those are the two blockers. Now, Level one of asynchronous alignment is let's try to relieve the blocker of the aggregator. Let's say, what do we need to do such that we can process these aggregations in order as they arrive without needing to wait for all of them? Turns out as long as your O plus is a commutative function, you can do this. And actually most GNNs that are permutation invariant are already level one aligned. So you can already randomize the order in which you apply O plus, you'll still get the same answer. This doesn't really change much in terms of synchrony because you still have this blocker before you apply the update. You need to wait for everything to arrive, but it's a start, right? Now let's try level two. Let's see what will need to be done to uh, update immediately when a message arrives. And in our paper, we prove that you can do this if your update function is associative with respect to your aggregator and also idempotent or for a more mathematically minded audience, your node outputs must satisfy a co-cycle condition, okay? And then you can call your update function immediately when every message arrives. And one typical way to satisfy level two is to just set your aggregator and your update function to be the same thing. And you further need to make them idempotent. So you need to get the same result if you apply it many, many times. And max is one example of an idempotent function. So your neural network equation now looks like this. We've set our aggregator to max and our phi function to the aggregator, which is also max. Yeah. Now with this equation, I can afford this unblocking here. I still have a block on all messages need to arrive before I can invoke my message function, but this is already a bit of asynchrony there. Okay, now level three, what do we need to do to be able to call a message function immediately when a new message is received? So now this is a highly asynchronous regime where there might be a lot more messages flying around than you normally would expect, but we can actually make this work too. And in our paper, we have a derivation showing that uh, if your message function is on top of all the other things we've done, if it is also a monoid multimorphism, then you can call your message function immediately after every update and not worry at all, the final answers will be the same. And specifically, what do we mean by monoid multimorphism? The psi function needs to satisfy these two properties. A psi function of a null uh, input needs to give a unit output, and a psi function of uh, a sum of two outputs, where this is a sum in the monoid space, so it might not necessarily be a sum. It might be sum with respect to the monoid you've chosen. It must be equal to a product of the corresponding applications of psi. Note here, I'm showing you the rule for psi of a single input. So this is a homomorphism rule, but in general, you can generalize this to a multimorphism case if psi accepts more than one argument. 
And once your PSI satisfies these constraints, you can now apply PSI immediately when some messages have arrived and send them to the node. And then more messages arrive, you can run PSI again and send another message. And your answer will still be exactly the same regardless of how you do this. And you might be wondering how to build a PSI that satisfies this uh, homomorphism constraint. Uh, one uh, specific strategy that we show works is you can take PSI to be a learnable linear transform, but not in the original Euclidean semi-ring, but in the max plus semi-ring in this particular case. So what this means is your message function is still a matrix multiplier, but you've reimagined the uh, plus to be max, and you've reimagined times to be plus. And now it works. Now, in practice, obviously, this will lead to super sparse gradients because for every row of your matrix, exactly one of them will receive gradients. So in practice, we actually use log sum x as a smooth approximation that will ensure you get gradients everywhere. And once you go climb the hierarchy, starting from simple sum GNNs to max max GNNs to log sum x GNNs, you can see how on various extrapolative algorithmic execution tasks, Generally, you also climb the ladder in terms of downstream performance. So this is something that not only theoretically seems viable, it also gives us much more stable and better execution performances compared to the other levels. Now, uh, I'm nearing the end of my talk. I would like to give you a few resources if anything I said today sounded interesting to you and you'd like to know more. Of course, there's a ton of stuff about neural algorithmic reasoning I wasn't able to tell you about today. So if anything I said today strikes your uh, attention and you want to learn more, we have a three hour long tutorial at Log22, which we made publicly available on this web page, algo-reasoning.github.io. And there you have the whole recording of the tutorial, all of our slides, all of our code examples, a huge collection of annotated references, basically anything you need to kind of kickstart your own investigation on top of anything you heard today. And if you come from combinatorial optimization, I trust there might be some people who work on combinatorial optimization problems. We also recently finally got published a 61 page survey on how to use GNNs for general combinatorial optimization and reasoning tasks. And uh, that's been published in JMLR a few months ago, specifically section 3.3 details the algorithmic reasoning stuff I told you about today with many other references. And before I close off this talk, I'd like to give some closing remarks on algorithmic alignment and how they might line up to some more popular concepts in machine learning today. <laughs> First, uh, you might see a lot of people talking that GNNs and transformers are super, super general architectures that can express uh, pretty much anything, but they're not that unrestricted when you think about it. MLPs are far more unrestricted. They have no structure to their inputs. Everything's connected to everything, yet we don't use MLPs, no matter how general they are, to solve all of our problems nowadays. So, and when you think about where transformers came from, where content-based attention came from, it actually came from a deep algorithmic alignment roots. And you might know this neural Turing machine paper, which actually derived the first form of content-based self-attention, which is at the heart of the transformer network. And they basically derived that layer by trying to simulate the reads and writes to a computer memory uh, in trying to make a differentiable computer. So the roots of attention are very much grounded in aligning to an algorithm, aligning to a computer even. So you can already say that MPNNs and transformers are not really fully general architectures, but they tread this very interesting spectrum of algorithmic alignment, where algorithms are trivially on the far left here, in the sense that they're trivially fully aligned to themselves, but they have no generality. You change the task a little bit, you have to rewrite a whole new algorithm. MLPs are on the other side. There's no restrictions on the format whatsoever, but you need a huge sample complexity to fit anything. There's zero alignment to your target algorithm. MPNNs and transformers are already hitting some spot in the middle because they have clear delineation of objects and they have clear modeling of the relations between those objects. So they're already trying to be more programmatic, but they're still trying to be also a bit general. Algorithmic alignment, in my opinion, allows us to explore this interesting spectrum here, which might lead us to a bit more specialized architecture, but one that will generalize out of distribution better than these guys that we already know cannot really generalize out of distribution. And lastly, you probably know, I've said the word alignment so many times today, but you probably know alignment under a different context, in the context of language models where it typically refers to alignment to human preferences, whatever that means. So scientifically, how easy it is to quantify human preferences, like the outcome of human preferences might vary very much depending on which humans you ask and what they care about and whether or not they woke up on the right foot in the morning, right? There's so many things that can change what human preferences means in terms of the signal you use for your alignment. Whereas algorithmic alignment is much different than that. You have a clear algorithmic target procedure, which is mathematically well-defined. You're aligning to it, and there's no ambiguity about do you satisfy this constraint or not, right? 
and at least for me as a scientist, I'm far more comfortable with a quantity I can measure and understand than a quantity that I don't think I'll ever be able to measure. And on that note, I'm happy to chat all about this during dinner and afterwards if you want to reach out later. Thank you so much to all the organizers for the invitation. I hope you enjoyed it and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.